everybody. Welcome as we prepare for the first Sunday of Advent. Ah, already Advent, which of course means Christmas not that far away. I guess we get tired of hearing people say that all the time, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Christmas around the corner, but it's true though. Hey, by the way, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hmm? So it's, I think it's one of my favorite holidays. Might be right, right after Easter. I think, I think it's number two probably. But anyway, we had a good time here. I feeding those who, you know, needed a meal or those who didn't want to eat alone. So I hope you had a good Thanksgiving and mindful of all that we should be thankful for. So anyway, as we begin this year C, the church has three years of readings, A, B, and C. It's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John is the filler, usually for Mark, shorter gospel, and for that special time after Easter, special readings. But anyway. So we get a variety of readings, and now we're going to Gospel Luke. And it's interesting, because right now, as I mentioned, we're preparing, you know, Christmas, and already the parties have started, Christmas cards, and I walk the park, the Christmas lights are up, people, maybe even Fixer Tech may even have their tree up already. Uh, yeah, see, they have their tree up, Fixer Tech, they're really one of the first people to get it going. So you think, oh, Christmas, all that joy, and yet when you read, they come to church, it's like, what? It's almost like a bummer because the readings are kind of still kind of heavy. The end of the world, Jesus coming again, and it's a little bit serious. You think, well, where's the joy? Where's the, hey, it's Christmas. Have a holly jolly Christmas, but not yet. It's Advent first. <sighs> so you understand Advent, it comes it's from the word, Latin word Adventus, which is translation of the Greek word parousia, which means coming. Advent means coming. And the church celebrates not merely the first coming of Christ 2,000 years ago, but also has our sights on Christ will come again, the second coming. So we're not just simply focus on what took place 2,000 years ago, though that's what Christmas is. But we live in Advent. We say, yes, we celebrate that coming when he came, but also we look ahead to that one day. We do not know when, when he shall come again. So it has like a duality, what took place 2,000 years ago and what is yet to take place. So that's what Advent tries to look at, and that's what we, we do look at here. Anyway, and it's the end of time, the parousia is the end of the world. And so let's see what we have here. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations and perplexity at the roaring of the seas and the waves, men fainting with fear, and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things began to take place, look and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then it skips a verse to 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that the day come upon you suddenly like a snare. For it will come upon all who dwell upon the face of the earth. But watch at all times, praying, that you may have strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Hmm. So the heavens of the earth will be shaken, and we will see Christ come down from the heavens. Now, first, that's a sort of a frightful, and it does say that about men fainting with fear. The first response for those who believe who are followers of Christ, his disciples, when these things take place, look up and raise your heads. So this is not out of fear. This is out of boldness, out of confidence. Yes, our Lord is coming. You know, salvation is here with us. And yet, it does warn us, though, don't let your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Hmm. Wow. So what do we do? We have to prepare for the final judgment. That one day we will be, you know, our Lord will come. Are we be ready? So what does, he, what does Luke tell us? One, he says, with dissipation and drunkenness. Well, that's pretty obvious what that means, I think. Hmm? Dissipation in Greek is the word kripale, which means literally an unbridled indulgence. Don't get wrapped up in this world, indulging in all the pleasures of the flesh, you know, money, pleasure and power. The weirdest thing I was scrolling down in, I think we read the sports pages, and, 
and one of the ball players who's now retired, he had him filmed, I guess at a gambling place, and then these were these, well, ladies scantily clad doing their dancing, whatever, very, you know, very provocative, and smoking, and that's the world. Huh? And that's what Jesus says, we're aware of that, being dissolute living, dissipating your life. Can't go there as a Christian. Then drunkenness. How, how many of us ever thought getting drunk is a serious sin? And we sort of do that, you know, we can't, sometimes we just seem to give us liberty. Well, it's Friday, out with the guys, with our, with our friends, Saturday night, whatever it may be, New Year's Eve, and we, we think no big thing of it. But he, Christ singles that out as a particular something to be avoided. Well, you look in the New, New Testament, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's very clear that drunkenness, deliberate inebriation, is a very serious, maybe you might say mortal sin. Paul says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. He lists other sins as well, but that's one of them. And so, he goes, why? Because you, when you're drunk, you don't have you know, possession of your powers, your intellect, your judgment. You can't do that. It's irrational. So will, drunkenness is willing to enter into a state of irrationality where actions can, be, can be, become beneath our dignity. So we just can't give in to drink. Mm. Now, we, I think we understand the dissipation and drunkenness, but the anxieties of this world, be careful of that. Mm. You know, it's funny because one is outright sin, but the other one, anxiety, the cares of things of this world, doesn't sound sinful, right? Well, but it is, it's becoming too focused on the realities of this world and losing focus on what is really important to the kingdom to come. And I'm afraid that affects a lot, a lot of people. Because we think people, well, we kind of think people do th these atrocities, and surely it's, that's them, maybe, or maybe, you know, should fear, should fear worry. But getting caught up so in this world that this, as if this is the world, is all there is, and then losing sight of what's most important and anxiety, being anxious about it, you're being consumed by it, that it blinds you. And Jesus points to that one. Wow. So what are we to do before the final judgment? And if he said, watch and pray at all times. Watch and pray. Keep vigil. Now, one of the things that Jews would often do, especially in Passover, is that they would stay up late into the night and they would pray. So praying deep into the night, one of the reasons they did this is because there was a Jewish tradition that held that when the Messiah would come, he would come on the night of the Passover. So in order to be ready for the Messiah to come at Passover, you needed to stay awake and pass overnight. It wasn't merely simply staying awake, but you needed to pray that you'd be ready in the state of righteousness and holiness when the Messiah would finally come. Well, I'd like to see him pray, you know. One thing, if it was just staying awake, what would you do? Staying awake. It's dark, there's no lights. I suppose you have a little gas candle or something like that, but what would you do? Right? And so you pray all night. I know about you, I find it difficult to pray without having something to read, to reflect on the scripture, but imagine just praying all night, hoping and waiting for the Messiah to come. And you got to, you know, give them credit because, uh, you know, our Lord has not come yet, and yet they, that's what they, uh, they would do. Mm -hmm. So, this, this, well, this one commentator brings out that staying awake at night or disturbing your sleep is a part of a fast. Fasting from sleep. I never thought about that, fasting from sleep. Hmm? Staying awake when you're tired and praying as a way of detaching ourselves from the pleasure of sleep. And sleep is pleasurable, hmm? isn't it? I mean, let's face it. <coughs> That's why you find it hard to get out of bed. Huh? Oh, not yet. Or isn't it a great feeling when you're tired and you just can't wait to lay down? Oh, isn't that a great feeling? You don't want to move. You just, oh, it just, oh, that feels heavenly. Hmm? So we teach ourselves then to detach ourselves from that. And I don't know, I'm sure the monasteries, monasteries still do that. There's some that still, I think the Cistercians, that they wake up in the middle of the night to pray. Usually I think about two in the morning or so. And they do go back to bed, by the way, but they first get up, and that's difficult. Hmm? Think about centuries ago when getting up at 2 in the morning. Now, you're out there in, out in the mountains. It's cold. Hmm? 
Whoa. You go to the chapel, the church, it's cold. There's no heater on. You'll be seeing your, your breath. And so you get up and pray, you're in the cold, that cold air, that cold atmosphere. And now you try to go back to sleep, so you're not going to sleep as well. And so that's what it was. It was the detachment from sleep, the pleasure of sleep. Now, please, of course, we got you, you, sleeping is very crucial to one's health. But there's something about it. Detach oneself from, you know, the praying. Hmm? Rise in the middle of the night in order to say certain prayers, for example, giving, giving up sleep willingly. In fact, the time they say that this, I forget what I read exactly those wording, but the, it's like two or three in the morning is where the evil activity is, is, is its strongest. And that's why they get up also that hour to combat that, to be that powerful force praying. So um, anyway, you may want to think about that. You want to fast? We think about food, maybe fast off social media, but how about sleep? Getting up and then praying, talking to God. Anyway, but that's what it says to pray and fast for the vigil, for the Lord who will be coming. So hope to see you Sunday, wherever you may be, if you're here. Have a blessed Advent, and let's get ready for the Lord. He's coming. Who knows? Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Just be ready. Come, Lord Jesus. God bless you.